Hello there guys and welcome to another one of my reviews. Today, as you probably already saw, we are going to take the new Toyota Corolla Cross out for a spin. Now, this is a very important car for the Japanese car maker because it has been in the making for quite some time. As you probably already noticed on the roads around you, everyone's buying a crossover or an SUV these days and the trend is not going to fall back anytime soon. So manufacturers have to put out cars like this. This is basically a Corolla on stilts and today we are going to talk about everything related to it and we're going to talk about its rivals, its drivetrains and how it drives most and foremost. So what is it? Well, as I already said, it's a Corolla on stilts. This car is meant to be a crossover positioned right between the Toyota CHR and the RAV4. And in terms of dimensions, it fits right in between them. It's almost eight centimeters longer than a CHR, but 15 centimeters shorter than a Toyota RAV4. So it fits in the segment right beneath the C segment. It's a subcompact crossover, if you will, even though the exterior dimensions might fool you a little bit. So this car rivals models like the uh, Mazda CX-30, like the Hyundai Kona, like the Honda um, um, HR-V or the Kia Niro. So plenty of rivals to tackle already. Now, uh, compared to its Toyota brothers, as I already said, it's longer uh, than the CHR and shorter than the RAV4, but it has a very high ground clearance, almost 20 centimeters, and that is just shy of what the RAV4 offers, but is considerably higher than the CHR. Now, another interesting thing about this car is the fact that it doesn't really look like a Corolla, does it? Uh, I mean, sure, it says Corolla on it, but its design is a bit different, and that's peculiar considering how Toyota does design these days because we already have higher riding versions of cars like the Aigo or the Yaris but they um, do have a similarity to their regular counterparts if you will. In this case the design is completely different and I think it reminds me of Suzuki's S-Cross model. Um, I think the headlamps do that for me but other than that we have typical Toyota design we have a huge grille that dominates the front end over here with uh, black chrome strips around it that's a package thing um, it's only offered on the top of the range models like this exclusive all-wheel drive version from the sides you'll notice the mud cladding around the wheel wells and of course on the bottom of the door cards and the doors do open and do cover the door sill so you won't get your trousers ruined when it's dirty outside like it is today. Now, in terms of wheel sizes, 17 or 18 inch wheels you can get on this car uh, and depending on the model range, on the model spec you go for, you can have this chrome trim over here or these longitudinal bars for uh, your extra luggage and they can be in black or other colors. This color, by the way, is called Barcelona Red. Looks pretty good, it creates a deep contrast with the black panels on this car. Now, from the back, I think this looks a lot like a RAV4. It's very upright and it has a lot of sharp edges. It looks pretty good um, and it's definitely not going to be confused with any other car on the road. You don't have the cross inscription anywhere on the tailgate. The only area where you will have the full Corolla Cross name is here on the C pillar. But everything is clear, clean cut and easy to digest, sort of, sort of speak. Uh, we have an electric tailgate on this model because this is the top range, the top of the range version. Um, but normal, non-exclusive models, if you will, do not get it. They get a manual uh, release. Now, in terms of boot space, there are two versions of this car. Um, so if you get the front wheel drive car, the boot will have a total loading capacity of around 420 liters. However, if you get the all wheel drive version, you will get an additional electric motor on the rear axle and that cuts into the space offered for luggage and you get about 380 liters. So you lose about 40 liters of space. Now we have additional space over here. We have the subwoofer for the JBL sound system over here. Uh, some more spaces over here, some space over here and more under the 
boot floor for miscellaneous stuff. We don't have a um, space saver um, spare wheel because we, this is a um, all-wheel drive version, as I already said. We do get a um, flat tire um, repair kit over here, though. So that's about it for the trunk. Of course, you can fold the rear seats and get a lot more room on this car. Let's see how um, it compares to the CHR in terms of legroom. So this is the interior of the car, the rear uh, side of it. Um, this car is um, equipped with a leather interior. Now let's talk about the materials on the door cards in the back. As you can probably hear, not exactly the best quality plastic. Uh, the same goes for this area over here, but this is a soft touch surface. We have a cup holder over here, but no extra storage in the door card. Let's take a seat. So as I said, this car has the exact same wheelbase as the CHR, so it doesn't really offer a lot more room inside. The driver's seat has been adjusted in my comfortable driving position. I'm six feet tall and about 250 pounds, and this is the amount of legroom I still have left. Let's check the headroom. So this is it. Uh, we do have a panoramic sunroof over here, which does cut into the space offered in the back, but I really wouldn't be able to travel for longer distances without asking someone to rip my head off because of neck pain. So yeah, this is my comfortable position right here. Not exactly perfect for people over six feet. And Toyota doesn't really want to change its ways either. Now, this interior will feel uh, very familiar to a lot of people because it has a, a lot of familiar features. Steering wheel, for example, looks exactly the same as it does on a number of other cars in Toyota's range. The buttons for the climate control are identical. The buttons for the heated seats, the same. Everything on the center console is the same as on the CHR, for example. Even the air vents are identical to the RAV4, for example. The materials used are nice. This is soft touch plastic um, and the space offered in the door cards is decent. As you can see, I have a bottle of water, my sunglasses and my wallet over there. So there's a decent amount of uh, room. You also have a very spacious um, center console um, but there is something I really want to talk about and uh, we're gonna discuss it right now and that would be this the brand new infotainment system uh, and uh, digital instrument cluster it was about time Toyota did something with its uh, instrument cluster and I think this will be adopted by a number of other um, Toyota models in the future and you can uh, configure it this screen you can configure the screen in a number of ways. You can display a number of useful information, whatever you want. Both sides can uh, show the same info. Now, this is a power indicator. That's the um, uh, speedometer. So you can choose whatever info you want. But what I like about it is that it has crisp, crisp graphics. It looks good. The design is great as well. Uh, and we have driving modes and look at these, these animations. They look absolutely awesome as well. The, this instrument cluster is also available as standard on all models and that is a big plus for Toyota. We also have a 10.5 inch screen uh, that doubles as an infotainment screen. Uh, it's a whole new infotainment system. It responds really well to your inputs. Maybe the graphics aren't as flashy as on some other rivals, but it does its job brilliantly. It has a new navigation system that's connected to the cloud and actually has really accurate traffic predicaments and it also knows about road work and other useful information including where um, the red lights are so pretty nice that said i think it's time to uh, get on the road and talk about the technical details of this car and how it drives let's go now that we hopped behind the wheel let's talk about the technical side of things so as i said this car is built on the same platform as the chr and the corolla so that's the TNGA platform and that comes with a couple of very familiar specs if you will. Now this car uses a fifth generation hybrid drivetrain which means the power has been amped and the car was made a bit more efficient and some other soft touches have been applied to it as well. For example the wiring has been changed, the inverters have been adapted and modified and so on. But overall it's the same principle of 
um, work behind them and that means in Europe you will only get the hybrid version and that means a two liter petrol engine under the hood that's naturally aspirated working under the Atkinson cycle capable of developing 152 horsepower along with 190 newton meters of torque now alongside it you will find a 113 horsepower electric motor that's good for another 206 newton meters of torque uh, but combined they can only deliver up to 197 horsepower and according to Toyota 190 newton meters of torque even though when you're driving on electric power alone you can access all of the 206 newton meters of torque of the electric motor I don't know why they report the power this way but they've been doing it for quite a long time uh, now depending on the model you get because you can all you can get this car in front wheel drive guys and you can also get it in all-wheel drive um, guys like the car we are driving today so this is an exclusive all-wheel drive model and all-wheel drive cars also get an additional electric motor on the rear axle um, so that electric motor will only power the rear wheels and its only job is to contribute when the car notices some uh, slippage or needs some extra oomph but the main idea over here is that no matter if you go for the all-wheel drive version or not the total power output you can get out of the three motors if you get the all-wheel drive version is still 197 horsepower so the car has an onboard computer that decides where to get the power from and that's why it's limited to this exact number but there are some differences in between these models depending uh, on the one you get in terms of weight the all-wheel drive version is heavier of course 60 kilos heavier um, and in terms of in terms of acceleration some models are faster some are slower but the differences are incredibly small this one for example has an acceleration from 0 to 100 kilometers an hour of um, 8.1 seconds if I'm not mistaken I might be and in, in which case I'll add the real number over here but as far as i know it's 8.1 seconds and the top speed is 180 kilometers an hour which should be enough anyway around europe maybe except in germany but you know the germans are quite special in that regard now in terms of driving this is a very easy to drive car and it has an e-cvt setup so that means if you've ever driven a cvt gearbox car uh, you already know that there's a discrepancy in between how much you press on the gas pedal the amount of noise you're going to hear from the engine under the hood and how fast you are accelerating and that's because of the way it is set up so basically the um, car gets its power from the electric motor or the internal combustion one or both of them at the same time so the car will rev the engine into its most efficient um, area of rpm if you will and um, then it will start accelerating so that's how a cvt works this is an ecvt so the feeling is exactly the same so there's a discrepancy between those items as i already said uh, but the car is very easy to drive the steering is incredibly light and the pedal feel uh, the brake pedal feel is quite nice as well the acceleration uh, the the go faster pedal if you will the gas pedal has um an instant response because of the electric torque it's just that you will hear the engine revving as i said um, it will seem like it will rev into oblivion and a piston might pop through the hood but it's well sound insulated and around town you will rarely hear it um, around town it will um, basically uh, be very quiet because most of the time you will be driving in electric mode you will be using the electric motor um, now there's a difference in this regard when you go outside the city limits because on the highway the noise will be quite persistent especially at speeds over 120 kilometers an hour because the car will rely on the internal combustion engine uh, alone to power itself on longer trips because the electric battery won't have enough charge in it uh, so yeah outside the city limits on the highway at over 120 kilometers an hour the car will be a bit noisier overall so you will hear the internal combustion engine a bit more but it's it's better than on the Aigo cross um, it's better on than on the Yaris cross for example or um, than on the uh, Honda HRV which is a rival for this car we'll get into that in a second but what I like the most about this car 
comes a standard and is impeccable. And that's the suspension. It's a McPherson setup on, up front, um, independent setup in the back, no matter if you get the all-wheel drive or the front-wheel drive version, as long as you have the two-liter uh, engine under the hood. Because there's a 1.8-liter version available as well that comes with the torsion beam, beam on the rear axle, but that's not available on every market. So this suspension is absolutely brilliant, incredibly quiet, incredibly comfortable, does everything you want from it brilliantly. I cannot praise it enough. It's a passive setup and yet it's comfortable and harsh uh, at times. It's a very well, the, the, the engineers did a very good job at finding a great mix between comfort and stiffness. It's a very supple setup and I like it a lot. Don't expect this car to be a great athlete either. Uh, in the bends, it will understeer, it will lean a bit. Um, you can get it to oversteer if you want, thanks to that electric motor on the rear axle. So if you push the gas pedal pretty hard, mid corner it will get the tail on the right um, the, the perfect line um, it's quite interesting but it's not a sporty car in any way you do have a power mode uh, to choose um, if you use this button but it doesn't really feel that comf that sporty anyway the difference is pretty pretty small and you actually feel like you're punishing the car for nothing um, so I guess you would be curious about the fuel consumption as well. Well, around town I saw an average of 5.2 liters per 100 kilometers covered with an average speed of 20 kilometers an hour, which is pretty damn good. As I said, most of the time you will be driving uh, in electric mode. Uh, then there's the uh, B-Road section where I had an average fuel consumption of 4.7 liters, which is even better. And on the highway, uh, that fuel consumption went up to 7.5. As I mentioned, you only rely on the uh, internal combustion engine at those speeds, and that takes a toll. So what's the conclusion? Well, I actually like this car, but there is a problem, and that's the competition and the pricing, especially within Toyota's own offerings. Now, for starters, this car is about 10,000 euros more expensive than a regular Corolla. Now, we're talking about the sedan, the hatchback, or the touring sports. Pricing will, of course, vary from country to country, but as far as I could tell around here in Europe, the difference between the Corolla Cross and the Corolla is about 10,000 euros. Now, you do get some more tech on this car. You get the new instrument cluster, you get the new multimedia system. But is that enough to justify the surcharge? Of course, this car is going to be a lot more popular because it delivers what people want. It has a higher ground clearance, 20, almost 20 centimeters, and it's almost as high riding as a RAV4. Um, so everyone's buying an SUV, a crossover these days. So I'm guessing it's going to be quite popular. But from a logical point of view, the Corolla does the exact same thing, but for 10,000 euros less. Is it worth it? I don't know. Especially if you consider the fact that the top of the range model in the Corolla Cross lineup is more expensive than a RAV4. And that's where things get even trickier because the RAV4 is a C-segment car, it's a lot bigger, and I think it's worth the money a lot more. Now, talking about rivals from other cars, we, we can talk about the Kia Niro, the Hyundai um, Kona, we can talk about the Mazda CX-30, and we can talk about a number of such cars. This is not a C-segment car, I repeat. This is a sub-segment car, uh, sub-C-segment car, uh, and you need to include it in the right um, segment, if you will, even though the segments these days are having some very blurred lines in between them. Another rival would be the Honda HRV, for example. So tell me which one of these cars you would get or what car you would get with the money this car costs, which is around, around 47,000 euros. So yeah, the pricing over here in Eastern Europe uh, starts at 36,000 euros and this car is about 45,000 euros. I'm sorry, I made a mistake earlier. So yeah, what would you get for 45,000 euros as a brand new car? Let me know in the comment section below. If you have any additional questions, don't be shy to drop them in the comment section below. That's what this section is for. Until next time, ciao.